So on this episode, you're going to learn everything you need to know about your e-commerce tech stack, especially if you sell on Shopify. Great episode you don't want to miss, so do stay tuned. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. I am your host, Kune Campbell. Now, on this episode, I interviewed Derek Haney. He is the founder of e-commerce tech. Now, e-commerce tech is a is a, it's a tech stack recommendations platform and agency run by Derek. And what he essentially does is he sits with store owners, with e-commerce directors, and recommends the best apps to solve their problems in their journey where they are right now as e-commerce stores and from an optimization and privacy standpoint. So we talked today about the e-commerce tech stack like like I haven't ever in this you know podcast. You know, in this podcast, every time I bring in someone, I'd always ask, you know, what are your favorite apps or you know, what are your favorite tools for running your business? You know, if, if it's like a founder. And then sometimes we, when it's more technical, when I'm, you know, interviewing more technical, you know, um, guests, a lot of them will tend to, you know, um, just share their, their, their tools, you know, willy nilly. But now on this podcast, it was very deliberate. You know, I, I got in into the cage with, with Derek and I was like, you know, you know what, you, you have to give me your understanding of what the ecosystem looks like, the crazy 25 apps, you know, coming into the Shopify store, launching app store every week. Now, if you're not, um, into Shopify, this episode might not be for you, but if like you're a Shopify merchant or you know you, you work with Shopify, this episode is a great one. Well, there's a lot of discussion on other podcasts and you know other blog posts around replatforming, but this one is what happens within Shopify. You know, exactly how should you what is the process of selecting you know solutions? Should you build in-house tools? or not, what about privacy, and you know, how to reduce clutter, essentially, in your Shopify store. So enjoy this episode, it's a favorite of mine. I enjoyed the conversation with Derek. I met him at another event I, I was at, and I thoroughly got on with him. We spoke the same language, and um, yeah, you, you will love this conversation if you're curious you know, about um, how to deliberately get the right apps for your Shopify store. So enjoy this conversation and I will catch you on the other side. Bye. The direct to consumer selling space. So if you work in marketing um, at an e-commerce business, you're a founder, um, essentially the ethos of this show is we're gonna help you sell more directly to your customers. Uh, so each week, um, you know, I can, I, I interview an expert, um, a founder of a direct to consumer e-commerce business or a representative from a best in class e-commerce SaaS product. And they're focused to help you grow metrics such as conversions, average order value, repeat customers, your audience size, and ultimately sales. Now, speaking of which, um, on today's episode, I'm super excited to have Derek Henney. Um, I, I met De Derek a few weeks ago um, at um, a, an expert panel, and we just got along, as in like, we were speaking the same language, essentially. And um, I, we, we just agreed that, um, you know, um, he was gonna come on this show. He has a podcast himself which is called the future of e-commerce e and um he also has events he runs events and um you know hopefully we'll we'll do something together um he's the chief e-commerce technologist at e-commerce tech.io and, and and that's that's the the destination where e-commerce stores go to research and discover the right tools to help them grow their stores um, he's, um, you, you, he was an ex, as far as I can remember, and I'm not reading this off a script. He was an ex, um, um, gorgeous, um, you know, marketing lead, di marketing director, I believe. Um, and, um, yeah, he, he just loves e-commerce tech, just tech. So to, on today's episode, we really want to talk about the e-commerce tech stack. And, um, it seems simple to some people because some people just go, bang, 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 click, 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 and screw up a lot of things. But so today we want to put some clarity into how to methodically 
build out your e-commerce tech stack. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Derek to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. Thanks Welcome. so much for having me. Yeah, let's get right into the tools. I love talking the nitty gritty. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, hold on. Before we get in, um, probably don't, not done you sufficient justice um, in your introduction. Should we just learn a little bit about you? I'll just hand over the mic to you. Yeah, um, it, it all started in college when I was uh, studying business management economics and, um, and we were doing $5 poker home games. Over the summer, I stayed to do uh, classes and all my friends went home. So I bought some poker books. And from there, I became a high stakes poker player. By my junior year, I told my, ba- wow. my dad I could pay tuition and rent and everything. And after my senior year in the 2008 crash, all my friends were having a really hard time getting work. And I was making a lot of money playing poker. So I knew what I was going to do for at least the short term. Um, it was a good run and I exited successfully. But um, it's not a it's not a it's not a long-term viable business strategy because it's just always putting in time and getting out money. So you have to think about how to transition out of a business mm-hmm. like that, you know, um, in order to grow something else. And I've always loved businesses and growing businesses and studying industries is really my bread and butter. So from there, um, multiple started multiple businesses, uh, agency with my wife, um, which led us to work very closely in e-commerce. One of those e-commerce companies offered me a job I couldn't refuse. So I was the director of growth and acquisition at BoxyCharm for a short while where we grew the subscribership significantly. Um, and I was also in charge of a very large advertising budget. Then I went over to the technology side and in-house at Gorgeous, I saw the beauty of the Shopify app ecosystem and how nice everybody was there. Everybody mm-hmm. in the space just wants everyone else to succeed. And I'm talking competitors sitting right next to each other, you know, sharing drinks and having a good time. And I really mm-hmm. appreciated that. Um, and I saw an opportunity to like speak about their businesses and analyze them from an outside perspective, um, which no one was doing at the time and and not very many people are still doing today. And so that's what brought me to start e-commerce tech and really uncover the the buying process of of technology and then think Mm -hmm. about how we can make that process significantly easier for for merchants because it is convoluted. It's um, it's changing very quickly. And it can be overwhelming, it can be time consuming, and making the the wrong decision is is costly for a business. So mm-hmm. there's a better way. <laughs> super, super interesting journey. I didn't realize you're a you're you're a pro um you know poker player. Um we'll have a lot to talk about off <laughs> off this um off this recording. But let's 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 dial into to e-commerce tech. Now in the e-commerce tech space, um some 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 retailers or some some merchants um, view their Shopify app like an iPhone. Like, you know, so when they get into the app store, sounds like the app store, <laughs> they just willy nilly pick and choose, test and test, um, you know, apps, they download apps, um, screw things up a little bit. Why is this a, a wrong approach? It's, uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a shiny object syndrome. And mm-hmm. I mean, the first thing that I think my, my uh, my father w- would have told me is there's no such thing as a free lunch. So if you think a free app is going to make you a lot of money, you're, you're going to be sorely mistaken. Now, it can solve a small problem in a business, but like, you know, starting by installing these free SEO tools or free optimization tools, whatever it is, um, it, it can be nice. It can be done. But um, a lot of some, some apps have been built um, fairly poorly and you can actually risk a lot of things in your site. Some are actually just scraping your data, um, even though mm-hmm. Shopify has policies in place to try and prevent this. It, you know, there's 25 new apps launching every week. So um, I'm, <laughs> I'm certain that intruders are getting in essentially. Bad actors yeah. are, are in the space. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I, I would, I think it's, it's totally fine to still use a Shopify app store. We're safe, but, um, but you, 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 st- you want to really think about what tools are going to make fundamental impacts in the business. Like, you know, things that are really going to change how we operate our company, how we're going to change our process after this. So like a basic example might be an upsell tool that incorporates your inventory that you want to get rid of so that you can clear out your warehouse space and stop paying for that for that extra product on the shelf, right? So maybe last month's mm-hmm. inventory becomes part of your upsell process and you can figure out the right tool to incorporate that. You're increasing average order value, but you're also decreasing margins. So you're integrating operations and, uh, and, and e-commerce or conversion rate optimization whatever you want to say at the same time. So that's a strategy that you might then go find a tool to execute on as opposed to, you know, stumbling across a tool, installing it, and then hoping to discover a strategy, um, which is what I think a lot of people are doing when they install some tools. 
Exactly, exactly. Speaking of which, um, what does the the landscape look like? You, you just talked about the fact that you know, twenty five new apps are you know driven every week or every every day. Every week, yeah, about five every a week. day. So, yeah, that's five a day. So, so what's the landscape? That's a lot of choice. Um, that seems to be like a very rowdy market at the moment with enormous opportunity, by the way. Um, so, so from your point of view, you know, as you know, you, you leave and breathe this, this, you know, this, this sector, tech stack and e-commerce. Um, what's the point of view today in 2021? And we'll talk about the future later, but what, what is current state of affairs? Yeah, well, we, you know, we're, we're, we're a bit more of a mature market, right, at this point. And it, it happened quickly the same way that the internet came on and then e-commerce came around. The Shopify apps ecosystem specifically has, has grown quite a lot. And, uh, and even in the broader e-commerce technology space and even technology at large, we have had over the last 10 to 15 years proliferation, which is the growth and, and strengthening of companies. So a small little uh, startup, you know, let's say, just say called MailChimp, you know, turned into this multi-million dollar, very well-funded company. And, and, uh, and that happened for Clavio and HubSpot came out of nowhere. Salesforce Tower is like 40 miles that way from here. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all these, all these technologies started to really do something really well. And what we're seeing now in the last three to five years is because of their growth and strength in one core area, they're actually able to acquire or build out functionalities in other places. So we see Klaviyo launching Klaviyo SMS. Privy now has SMS, email, and um, maybe one other thing, their conversion op um, optimization component on top of it. And you're, you're seeing this Yachtpo is acquiring a lot of different companies. And we even see e-commerce technology funds being launched, which means mm -hmm. venture groups are coming together and saying, yeah. we're going to put $180 million into e-commerce technology investment. And when you start to see like where this, you know, where this is heading, going a little bit in the future, like, you can see that these technologies are going to be integrated and working together, and we're seeing a lot more of that today. So a little, a little bit more really high quality uh, f features and functionality under one roof. So you're looking for one tool, it doesn't do everything, but maybe it does three or four things really well for you. Yeah, I've been approached by a number of, um, well, plat well, well, consolidation, um, you know, um, companies that seem to just um, have a portfolio of um, apps they just recently purchased um, for God knows how much. Um, it's, it's very, very, very fascinating. And um, do you envisage a coalition course, you know, um, in the sense that if you look at it from a marketer standpoint, um, especially from a retention, you know, perspective, you know, having to go to one platform um, to do say SMS marketing, having to go to another platform for email collection, for setting up, you know, all the, um, the, the pop-ups and, and, and the like, and then going to another platform for email seems a bit spread out. So um, do you think these consolidations will happen and then um, there will be a battle for it or or there's, there's enough for everybody even when the consolidation happens and then that just takes out the smaller players that seem to be building out individual apps for singular functions. The, and then what's well, the impact on, on bloating? Because there, there, there's some platforms that you know try to, re, to consolidate a lot of their smaller platform, uh, smaller apps, and then you know the output was a pretty bloated you know, um, user experience. I think that there is, you know, as as a technology grows, it actually creates cracks in the market for new opportunities to come in. And that's why right now some standalone SMS providers are better than their larger, let's say, customer data platforms, SMS functionality. And so that's, it's kind of interesting to think about that now. And so that you can move faster in one space than you can in all spaces. Um, that, that definitely is possible, but I do think that um, when you think about the the user experience, which in this case is the marketer user experience, it is better for them to have all of these things in one place. And I'm kind of like a firm market dynamics believer. If it's better for me to have all of my tools under one roof, then eventually all platform, like only the most successful platforms will have to have all the tools under one roof. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's going to be a painful battle and there will be survivors that are standalone. Um, but the, you know, the largest part bubble in, in the pie will have to be um, 
all inclusive tools that can do a lot of things very well. And that actually goes to speak a lot to what we're seeing. We talked about 25 apps uh, a week launching. Similar to the proliferation of e-commerce and 100,000 new stores launching on Shopify every year, as well as, I'm going to say something a little controversial, the lie that a lot of people are being fed about being able to start a drop shipping store and make money immediately, like the, the, that kind of get rich quick component, mm -hmm. that's, that actually also exists in e-commerce technology. People are thinking they can just launch a little app, make a little side hustle, maybe 5,000, 10,000 a month, and they'll be rich, right? Or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And that's becoming a lot harder now as well. So as as technology has successfully proliferated in the market, we reach an equilibrium and competitive advantages become more important and building a moat and building something truly unique yeah. and differentiated is there. And we're seeing this in e-commerce as well as e-commerce technology play yeah. out almost simultaneously, ironically, as I think about it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it's going to be harder to launch apps because they're going to need to be better funded in order to slice a knife through the big players in the market, you know, and really mm -hmm. find that, that little groove that they can they can fit yeah. into. Yeah, yeah, this is pure adaptation and evolution here, you know, right here. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, looking behind the scenes of like Shopify stores, which, you know, you have seen a ton, you've been, you know, um, privy to, to see a ton. Um, how many apps is too much? What, what, what is the threshold? Is, is, is there even a threshold in, in terms of, um, you know, what, what a backend, what your Shopify app list should look like? There's no, no, no amount of apps is too much, but um, that does. But most people are still going to bloat their tech stack. So uh, useless apps, apps that are um, poorly designed, which may, maybe means not loading asynchronously, which is kind of one of the first things you want to look for. Um, <laughs> I was reading a thread in one of my Shopify developer communities, and th they said that they found a dev firm. There was a merchant saying, uh, you know, our, our page speed load time is so slow. We want this JavaScript, uh, you know, to not be on or to not load and slow down our site. And so the dev firm put this this whole widget in an iframe, which means that Google can't see it anymore. And it's like a really terrible way of doing uh, a coding in general. But the site mm -hmm. score went up. And so they called it a victory. They wrote a blog post on it. And then they just got reamed in the developer community like, this is really bad for your merchant. You need to go back to the other way. Like site speed wasn't actually a problem and you were just like making a worse pro a problem worse. So, so um, when it comes to when it comes to apps, you kind of have, a, you know, not everybody is the most tech savvy. I'm not even the most tech savvy as far as a direct, like being a coder and really understanding how the app is, is going to have impact in uh, on site. But what, what I do know is that what... Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Did you know that cloud hosted e-commerce platforms like Shopify and BigCommerce do not provide automatic backups? Rewind steps in to protect Shopify and BigCommerce stores with automatic backups. Rewind is trusted by over 25,000 stores install rewind and get to test it for free over seven days and to extend the seven day trial to 30 days head over to rewind.io their website and mention 2x e-commerce if we can measure the ROI of each individual tool and they're all performing as expected, then no app, there's not too many apps that you can have because each one is making you more money. Now, as that, as, mm -hmm. as the technology starts to uh, grow a bit, you have more people managing tools. You have to make sure that you have to go back to some tools that it were, let's say set and forget two years ago and make sure that they're still the best solution for you today. And so there is a maintenance cost going on there. And of course there's an actual cost of technology and, uh, and a cost to your resources and how it might affect your processes and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, um, if you had a hundred very successful apps on your store, then kudos to you, it's working. Um, I think that the most successful Shopify and Plus brands that I see have a couple dozen uh, apps installed for, for them, and, and they're all working in a beautiful harmony. Now, that being said, if you're starting or you're early, you know, it's probably, it should probably be a smaller number of, of things that you can control. But as you, as you grow and you, you have a third, third party logistics providers and you have a finance department and you, you know, and you have a dedicated uh, split tester, conversion rate optimization expert in the company, and you have advertising technologies, right? And there, there's a whole bunch of things that, that start to come into play as the business grows. And then even things that aren't installed as apps, but are fundamental to, to the business um, as technologies are also important to manage and understand how they're impacting the store. So would you suggest 
running an audit every six months or 12 months what what what, what kind of cadence should should you have in place as a you know store owner or an you know e-commerce manager um in terms of just you know managing your tech stack so what i what i do when i work with merchants we give consultations to merchants for free and we're, we're able to um, really get into the nitty-gritty of what their stack looks like and what they should be doing so depending on the growth rate of the business the current state of the business as well so if let's just say um, some of my, my favorite brands to work with are like about at that million dollar mark and they've got this beautiful product and this great brand presence and they're starting to really take off in growth. So for that type of brand, I think every three months you need to reconvene, look at the roadmap that you've built prior or create one from scratch if you've never done it, which most haven't and say, okay, here are our biggest opportunities. You know, okay, it looks like maybe if we can get retention up by 10%, this will fundamentally impact our business. Or maybe it's like, we're having a really hard time connecting our, uh, our, our inventory management system to our third and fourth store, or we want to do global expansion. So there's, there's all sorts of different technology. I'm not even mm -hmm. giving that many good examples, right? So, so you've got this like roadmap and then you execute on one or two things at the top of that list, because it will take two to three months for any major technology implementation change, as well as to get the results so that you don't break the business just by trying 10 things at once. Uh, and, and then the next quarter you say, okay, that worked, or maybe that didn't work. And then you say, what's, what's next? What, what should be the next big thing this quarter? Yeah. Makes makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. It'd be nice to automate it all, wouldn't it? <laughs> so that's the dream that we have. I think that there is a way, um, and we're we're building technology towards this to mm. understand store data, understand industry data, and 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 look at aggregate technologies, including things like how, who they integrate with, how long have they been installed on all stores across the ecosystem, because mm -hmm. we can actually see a lot of this data, and then make a, and, and then also, what is the increase in conversion rate? Let's just imagine mm -hmm. we have two groups of stores, and my Shopify app is installed on both of them. I have the store data where um, 489 stores have SMS installed and working on them, and, uh, and 487 stores, whatever, it doesn't have to be the same number, um, don't have SMS installed and working on them, and we can see the conversion rate of these two things we can say okay sms increases conversion rate by one percent on the store and then we can say okay one percent of net revenue for a million dollar company is ten thousand dollars is and right and we can say you know should you implement sms today it's a ten thousand dollar opportunity right and, yeah. and so we can prioritize that automatically through looking at in uh data and then present those options to the merchant for them to go execute on. That's but, uh, very, very fascinating because it takes you one level beyond the um, the reviews. So most most um, you know e-commerce people will um, make a decision on an app based on the number of reviews, and that's arbitrary. That could be gamed um, in you know in some instances. Although you know many platforms are starting to you know um, clamp up on, on clamp on that. But you know, I'm going deeper would be very, very, very fascinating. Which takes me to, um, you know, those third-party tools on Chrome like um, Commerce Inspector or Koala Inspector, that mm -hmm. kind of um, you know give you a tech stack of a Shopify store. They're not 100% accurate, but the data is there. You know, um, with with Commerce Inspector, for instance, it can give you the the revenue range, all the apps installed. Um, and, and then, you know, you can imagine with what you guys are about to do, taking it into, you know, Shopify, getting all those data points and determining, you know, what the ROI of, um, you know, um, getting, um, of, you know, installing one app will be. Yeah. I will be looking forward to that for sure. Yeah. It'll be interesting because every app has their own case study about how they impacted store revenue. But mm -hmm. if we can look aggregately at merchants that have used the tool versus haven't, and then look yeah. at the underlying difference in their revenue amounts, you know, solving for yeah. some things like size of store. So trying to make similar stores kind of come together, then you have a real uh, size of impact of, of different tools and technologies from from an agnostic uh, viewpoint, which I think is yeah. is never been done yeah. before. It's more like a data warehouse, really. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's talk about like, so at the minute, at the moment, how should you know, listeners, e-commerce managers, e-commerce directors vet tools without asking colleagues in, in forums, you know, um, and beyond looking at reviews on an app, um, what methodic steps should they take um, before hitting that install button? 
the so the first we have to talk about reviews first the first thing I, I just interviewed somebody an app developer who built their own essentially algorithm to find fake reviews of the shopify app store because they were tired of like a competitor sprouting up and getting four thousand reviews in like a day it's like obvious right so um so there are a lot of fake reviews out there and the and aside from uh fake reviews gaming the system um which we will assume is a very small percent like a one percent kind of cost to all of us um, when there are real reviews, they still don't really explain if this is for my type of business. So for that reason, actually our entire platform, we do not do reviews. It's our review of the technology. And then we try mm -hmm. and explain what type of business is this going to be best for. So, and, um, and I do think that there is some quality in a review from a trusted source or somebody that you really understand, but most of the time a star rating review, uh, is, is totally garbage. If it's 4.9 or 1.2. It's often due to a lot of things, uh, some, some of which are outside of the control of the app, some of which have been solved for, and some of which are just the merchant's fault, right? Like the, the merchant sucked at running their store, blamed the app, and, uh, and then they've got a bad yeah. review. So, and, and then also some tools are self, uh, you have to be inside every day. Other tools you plug in once and never have to use again. And the tools that you are in every day, you're more likely to review than the tools that you plugged in once and never have to use again. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so all sorts of reasons why it's tough to really look at number of reviews and that rating uh, number as social proof, the same way that you would in e-commerce, right? Where e-commerce, if you've got 400 people that bought a weighted blanket and they're all raving about it, you're like, this is probably for me. Like it, it really does work at social proof. So, so the review side uh, is, is definitely don't use those as strongly and friend recommendations are still good. Asking groups and forums. Yes, that's, that's kind of the only thing we can do right now. Uh, and then the Google search, of course, uh, that gets you a short list. So the most important thing I would say, gather your short list of, of biggest players in the space. You really do want to invest in a technology that's going to outpace everyone else. So venture backed is a nice little bonus point, I would say, because they're, they're likely to be growing faster. Um, once you've got your short list, you're going to probably have to enter into a demo process, which is unfortunate, but you're going to have to demo each of the technologies. And of course, the, this is the, the larger of a technology purchase. This is like a email service provider or an inventory management system, yeah, you really want to broaden those options. So of course, the more money you're putting in, the more time you got to take up front. That's an obvious one. If it's a $5 widget that just solves something, then, you know, two options and in installing one, watching the video from start to finish, or even installing and tinkering to see if it actually solves your problem can, can often be done um, in, in some of those smaller instances. But for the larger ones, you need to understand how is it going to integrate in the rest of my stack? Right. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're thinking about implementing, I, I had somebody. Oh, man. Um, they're, yeah, their they're pop up tool can't talk to their email service provider. I'm like, you have to change one like you can't exactly. have this. This is this is this is an incompatible stack. Right. And, and you, you have yeah. a few things like that, that that occur from time to time where you realize um, other ones are common with shipping and logistics tools that are unique to like a local printer or local shop kind of business that mm -hmm. it's just not integrating into their to their their shipping system is not integrated into their local office or something like that. So you, you, you always need to be thinking, how is this going to work from the business process standpoint? How is it going to change my business process? And can we actually get that to work? Another important factor, I think, is resources. Who is going to manage this tool on an ongoing basis? Who's going to report on its success or failure? And what metrics will make it successful or, or a failure? Um, so that one's important. Another important factor to look at as you're going about vetting tools is what do they bill by? Some people bill by how many website visitors you have. Some people bill by how many emails uh, are on your list. And then the good ones now in email service providers are billing you on how many active contacts are on your list. In e-commerce, uh, there's, a, there's a tool that actually can clear out the uh, you know 10,000 emails that haven't opened uh, something from you yeah. in the last six months. And, and people forget to do that. And they're, so your Clavio bill just kind of is up and up and up and up and up. And you're like, holy okay. crap, I'm playing $350 a month. And, um, and it looks like only 50% of my audience is, is opening the email. What do okay. I do? So yeah, you got to cl cleanse every once in a while, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and but some, some people are, are good actors. There's a tool called Spently that has dynamic pricing. They, they send based on the number of shipping notification emails that you send out. They know that Black Friday and Cyber Monday is a big month. You're going to send thousands more than, than the previous month. So your bill for that month is going to be higher. And a lot of companies in that month, 
jack you up three pricing tiers and then they keep you there for the next year. With, with Spently, when it sees the bill on the next month is significantly lower, it adjusts your bill down on the following month so that it says, look, you're not sending as many, so you qualify for this tier, we'll put you here, All right? And so, so looking for that is important. Those are bombs, you know, that, th those are really, you know, really, really, really good points. Um, you know, thanks, thanks for sharing. Now, some merchants are on Shopify Plus. And um, obviously, you, you have to be a Shopify, Shopify Plus approved developer. Should merchants look there first? You know, look, okay, who are, you know, the Shopify apps or who are the players serving, you know, this exclusive club of, um, you know, Shopify Plus merchants? Um, sh sh should that be a first, first check um, so just to filter out all the, the, the chaff? It's, it's not a, a bad, uh, it's not a bad idea. I've, I've never really thought about it that way, but I would say that the, the Shopify plus, uh, apps are, are going to be the cream of the crop. Um, and even, I know some people that have actually built on Shopify plus first and they launched new tools and technologies there, but the, the tools were designed like for the checkout page or for some form of, uh, enterprise merchant, let's say, or upmarket merchant. And so for that reason, it made sense for them to build on plus. So um, in a way, the answer is like, yes, if they're, if they're a plus um, app partner, then they are more likely to have a robust technology. They're more likely to have been funded, actually. They're more likely to uh, have uh, understanding of how the, you know, your, they might affect page speed load time and loading asynchronously. They might have better data control uh, systems in place. And, they, you know, so there's, there's a lot more that comes from that at the same time. Uh, they might be more expensive. They might be mm -hmm. too robust for the solution you need. So you'll mm -hmm. still have to go back to the things we were just talking about to figure out mm -hmm. if it's right for you. But um, it, it's, it's a, I guess, a, another like nice to have checkbox there. There are thousands of apps and technologies that are not on plus that are still viable for a business. Mm -hmm. So, so it doesn't mean that you can't uh, implement the solution, but yeah. At least it tells you like, well, if I graduate to plus in the future, uh, you know, they've, they've got the plus partner program and they seem to be a great fit for plus merchants. Very interesting. The question I actually wanted to ask, um, that was a filler question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honest um, in, in this podcast, but the question I really want to ask is um, there's some um, pricing models that are um, that are based on a percentage of, um, you know, the money they make you. So it could be like an abandoned cart solution that um, says, okay, we, we just um, saved you a thousand dollars. And so we're going to charge you 15% off the back of that. So you pay them 150 for every, you know, um, $1,000 or 15 for every hundred, you know, hundred dollars, you, you know, they make you. Um, I've always felt a bit uncomfortable with that model. Um, it almost feels like, like they're affiliates in, in, you know, in a way. Um, I would love to, to know your thoughts and I would also love to know your thoughts around um, apps that are outside of the Shopify, um, you know, ecosystem, you know, so there's some standalone apps. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Clavio is a growth marketing platform that powers over 25,000 online businesses. Clavio understands every single customer interaction and empowers brands to create more personalized marketing moments. Listen analyze and act on your customer data with Clavio. Visit clavio.com forward slash 2x. That you cannot get directly from, you know, the Shopify app store. Um, is it a yes or a nay? <laughs> um, so first percentage of revenue, it is very scary for me too. It's like, how many more of these apps can I install until like, I have like negative 70% margin. Sorry. Like, and, so, and, and the, the first thing to do with an app like this is take that percentage extremely seriously. Even if it's 1% or less, you need to say, how are you calculating this? How can, how can I trust the result? And there are, um, there are, everyone has a different metric for measuring. Like if, so if you, if you look at two leading SMS providers, one mm -hmm. of them will actually calculate how the, um, how, whether they take credit on a sale or not. So one is they clicked on the link in the SMS, whereas the other one is they were served an SMS message and then later converted. That is fundamentally significantly different. It's impression versus clicked, right? And, exactly. and the, and in both cases, by the way, they take percentage of the entire, they take 100% of the cart 
as their credit, right? So, the, which is, is a bit problematic because hmm. um, what about Facebook ads? They they had a they had a percent attribution here. What exactly. and what about the people that were going to buy regardless of the text message? Or exactly. what about email that they click through? Uh, one hour after the text they clicked on and then purchased, right? So like, like you know, it's not even last touch attribution modeling. It's, it's, a, it's a totally broken attribution model. So that's the, the first thing is like true understanding of attribution. And they don't actually have to be correct for you to say yes to them. So even if you say, well, it's on click and we're just going to give them 1%, you can still agree to that because it can be ROI positive for you, right? It can, you can actually see that, that return on there. But what you do need to do is measure it separately from them and make a calculation there. This actually brings me to maybe a bigger takeaway that I don't think anybody's doing out there that they should, which is split test installing your technologies. Uh, so if you're going to do SMS, and this, you know, from start to finish, you actually have to roll this out and test its uh, its impact on on total revenue, total conversion, because you can see that it increases conversion rate. But how does it impact the other things in the business? You're not going to know unless it's a real time split test where 50 percent of your audience is being served an SMS pop up and getting and we're collecting their phone numbers. 50 percent of the audience is being served, let's just say, an email pop up and not mm -hmm. being asked for SMS, and they're not going to get any SMS marketing off of that. Now, remember, in the 50% where we serve them, the mobile pop-up, uh, only 2% of people are going to give us their phone numbers. But we have to look at the 50-50 audiences and compare the overall conversion rate change to understand the impact. If we just start looking at the people that gave us their phone numbers and how they convert, that's convoluted data. It's not really going to tell us the overall impact on the business. So Appreciate testing the tools is a great way to determine if it's profitable enough. And then finally, on, on, the, on the topic of revenue sharing, um, yeah, uh, so, um, what was I going to say? Just, just make sure if it works for you, it works for you. But at some point you, um, you do not want to be in a revenue share model. You want to negotiate your way out of it or look for tools that solve that problem without taking a percentage of revenue. The only, the, the time, and you mentioned affiliates, the only time where giving a percentage of revenue makes the most sense is if they are the dedicated channel and can give you full confidence that they completely created this transaction for you. So one example of this is actually an upsell tool where the upsell is the only way that you can add this product to the cart. Uh, Order Bump does this really nicely. It's a Shopify Plus add-on at checkout. And it's like, if you're on the checkout page and you hit the yes, add this product to my cart button, and then you buy that product, that is like 100% that amount of yeah. money there at upsell mm -hmm. is contributing is from order bumps uh, software and technology. Now, maybe there's another technology or another place in your funnel you could have put this to get more sales. So, you know, it's not 100% incremental impact, but it's pretty close, as close as you mm -hmm. can get. So it's, that's fairly clean. Um, yeah. You mentioned apps outside of uh, the- Yeah, the outside the ecosystem. So- um, I, the, the, um, I worked at, at Gorgeous and I have a strong opinion about Zendesk. Zendesk, which is a leading uh, help desk platform, is phenomenal for SaaS, phenomenal for big business and even big retail and, and multi-channel, uh, like really complex, you know, hundreds of agent ecosystems and, and, and stuff like that. But they don't understand e-commerce. They built a Shopify integration like a long time ago and they just they haven't done much to maintain it. Uh, so when you think about um, a, a help desk, you want it to be built for e-commerce. When you think about a, an email service provider, you want it to be built for e-commerce. An SMS provider, hugely important for e-commerce. You know, you need those abandoned cart messages and those templates and those triggers um, to be there. So you really do want your tools and technologies built for e-commerce. I'll give you actually another example of would be, I really like this tool, Sumo. Sumo is a great pop-up builder. They weren't really built for e-commerce. They were built for broad internet usage. They've had some yeah. e-commerce uh, adoption. And so they have some functionality there, but Privy as a, like the leading e-commerce pop-up tool, like kind of beats them across the board. I'm sorry to say yeah. to, uh, to Noah Kagan and the Sumo team. The, but um, and so there are just situations like that where an outside player just can't compete with somebody that's built specifically for e-commerce. That's definitely a box you want to check when you're, when you're vetting a technology. I mean, I remember when Cart Hook, the one click, it was a one page checkout solution, um, used to be off Shopify. Um, I'm on their website now and, um, you know, there's a big call to action, which just says add the app to, to show, you know, add it on the Shopify store. So they're, they're nudging people outside of, you know, their, 
their website to to their Shopify, you know, store, um, you know, website. Let me have 14 reviews and it's just 3.4. We'll talk about checkouts in the Shopify API shortly. But before we do that, I, I really want to ask around um, or about attribution. Um, attribution is, I think it's the number one headache now with um with 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 the evolution um or the transition rather from third party cookie data to first party data um and and so it's it's ever so important for marketers to efficiently spend um their money's well um what platforms in the shopify ecosystem um are you see, seeing doing a terrific job it has to be a stellar you know job it has to be you know almost near near perfect although you know that there's no such thing as perfect attribution you know customers you know we have to just follow customers wherever they are based on um their convenience um so, so, so what platforms are you seeing doing a a decent job now with attribution um worth checking out when we're talking about attribution the first thing to mention is that we don't have to see how all customers convert in order to have a very clear picture of our attribution model. So playing poker, you don't have to know, you know, what the next card is to make the right decision, right? So there's there's always mm -hmm. hidden information here or lost information. And with, you know, the reduction of third-party cookie data, we're likely to lose more information in the future, which means we're gonna have a smaller percentage of our audience well-tracked in how they converted across multiple channels. With that said, the biggest problem with, let's say, multi-channel attribution is that it's extremely confusing as an individual, as a human being, to solve this. So like if you've ever looked in Google Analytics, you can see, okay, this person did click on a Google ad and then on a Facebook ad. Well, should I give it 50-50 for Google and Facebook? That's kind of what I think, like, you know, just like looking at the data. But mm -hmm. there's actually a very complex modeling system that needs to be applied, which basically put it simply, um, humans are not going to be able to solve this problem by themselves which it makes brings me to a, a really cool technology and i'm sure there are more out there and even before i tell you about this one tool i think in the next five years i believe attribution will be solved and essentially baked in to uh to just like launching i think you'll just have to start by having clear attribution so i think we're getting to a point thanks to technology where this is about to become a solved problem for marketers that being said, I've been saying that for about seven years. So, <laughs> so we'll see another, give it another seven and we'll see if it actually comes true. If it happens. <laughs> yeah. So, so this tool called Rockerbox is really amazing because it uses mm -hmm. machine learning to uh, understand the sources that your users are coming from, what they're purchasing, including, you know, average order value and lifetime value. And then it's building the model of attribution based on what it can see. So that mm -hmm. is like magic to me. It also plugs into your advertising platforms to, to get a better feel for, for how this is working from platform to uh, site and then also to channels like email and SMS as, as well. So that's really a, a great tool to use. There's another one that's a little bit simpler called Little Data, which just helps clean up uh, some of your attribution mistakes in Google Analytics, especially great for subscription brands. Uh, and then one other thing on attribution that I think is important is that uh, post-purchase surveying. So we do need to actually, aside from seeing it ourselves with our data, we are going to need to ask customers where they came from, especially because things like friend recommendations and other offline activities may have influenced mm -hmm. their buying behavior. So it'd be great to see that. And if the second they buy from you is this is like, that's the exact second where they're willing to spill the beans on how they heard about you. Not the second before, because that's interrupting our, our conversion event that we really want. Uh, and not, you know, three months later when they forgot who who we are or, or how they heard about us. So there's one called Inquire Labs that simply on the thank you page just asks you, how did you hear about us? And you've got your channel selection and boom, you can easily kind of build that pie and then, um, you know, plug that in with the rest of your attribution data and make some good marketing decisions about where to invest. And where does that data pipe in, to, pipe out to from Inquire Labs? Does it update uh, any, any other um, key? I've, I know that it goes out wherever you want it to go and can mm -hmm. plug back into that user's, let's say, Klaviyo account or customer data platform. So you can see mm -hmm. on an individual level who, um, wh what they've uh, said their their um, their channel, sure. their attribution channel is. Will so you might, have, yeah, somebody that comes in from Google says, actually, I heard about you on social media, right? Because they just went and Google searched your name right after. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you can kind of get clearer attribution there and then make a decision 
on on how to adjust the model. So like mm-hmm. like you said, the model is not 100% accurate. You might we might look at what it's telling you and then take in kind of I hate to say it, but some opinion data and then the yeah. opinion mixed with the data, the opinions on top of the data is, is going to be strong enough to make decisions. Gives you a full picture. Exactly. Um, no, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, Shopify in itself, um, given the fact that, you know, it's, 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 it's hosted, it's a cloud solution, um, is able to give us, you know, a, a good idea further on from a single customer view so if i look at a contact um shopify should you know be able to tell me the interaction you know spots based off on um you know traffic sources and utms um in a historical sort of chart you know um, i would expect it at some point but i don't know i don't know i don't know okay um, i'm just gonna wrap this um this up um with, with two more um sort of sections subsections um the first um i really want to talk about this because um you know a few months ago shopify did release this which was the shopify checkout api and um there was some sort of excitement uh, whether it's manufactured or not i you know i don't know but people seemed excited especially in the twitterverse you know about um this shopify you know api and the second is um i'm going to jump into the shopify store and based on categories i'm just going to ask you your your top um they will have about 12 categories here i'm just going to ask you your, your top three <laughs> apps okay. per per you know per those categories but let, let's start out with the first question which is this um shopify api um you know they, they there was a big fanfare you know a lot of people they brought lots of influencers to celebrate the fact that you know they they have a you know a checkout api um and that in itself seemed like um a an ecosystem within an ecosystem um i would just love to hear your thoughts from an e-commerce tech stack you know stack points as to its potential um and um its potential and its its limitations essentially it, it certainly opens up opportunity for new technologies to enter a space that couldn't actually exist prior. Um, but let's start with kind of why Shopify did this. Shopify didn't do this to help merchants or help app providers. Shopify opened up their uh, API in order to capture subscription revenue from uh, that they were missing because uh, currently they didn't offer any form of subscription. So Shopify looked at the subscription brands that are in their portfolio and said, oh my God, they're all checking out using Recharge or Bolt subscriptions or somebody else. And they said, we want that revenue on our platform because Shop Pay, right, is our system. And and the, the good news about this is that Shop Pay is a really great checkout system, similar to how you check out on Amazon. You can two click or get your phone to like type in a code. And it's, so it's really smooth and it's great that you can check out across multiple Shopify stores with these. Fully support that. And I love the idea of making Shop Pay easier and more accessible to people. That being said, like the reason Shopify did this was so that they could capture that revenue. And it kind of did hurt their partners in the subscription space uh, relatively significantly. And I think might, might have a bigger impact on them. Now, what, what, what's changing here is that if you check out on it for a subscription product that um, I guess yesterday, let's say, it, you would actually go to like rechargeapps.com to complete your checkout. Now it'll all take place at the, the Shopify uh, domain or subdomain or your site, your, your checkout, your regular checkout process. And what's happening. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Did you know that cloud hosted e-commerce platforms like Shopify and BigCommerce do not provide automatic backups? Rewind steps in to protect Shopify and big commerce stores with automatic backups. Rewind is trusted by over 25,000 stores. Install Rewind and get to test it for free over seven days. And to extend the seven day trial to 30 days, head over to rewind.io, their website, and mention 2x e commerce. On the back end is that the subscription billing platform is talking to shop pay to get all of the information it needs to ensure that there's a recurring subscription. So there does need to be technology built on this. They only opened up API access. They don't have a place where customers can go to manage their subscription or anything like that. The third party tools still need to exist for that to happen, which is great Mm -hmm. because that means that third party tools will be incentivized to build a lot of functionality around things like skip a month, cancel my subscription, um, you know, getting loyalty points for staying subscribed and integrations with all those functionalities. So that's really what it's opening the door to. And it's, it's allowing for 
uh, more competition in the subscription space. Uh, mm. But it's not, uh, but they're doing it for their own reasons is the best way to say it. <laughs> and control. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so what happened? So, you know, if I was like recharged, for instance, so I'm, I'm, I'm on their page and I could see about five um, major providers there. Um, there's sales subscriptions, there's Bolt, there's um, Payroll, um, there's um, Recharge, and there's Thinmatic. Um, so I would like to think that prior, um, they were making a lot of transaction, you know, fees, you know, they're, they're making one, two, maybe even two and a half percent, you know, in the past. Um, so, so now essentially Shopify has stripped them off that. Um, then they no longer have the payment gateway capability. Every payment has to go through Shopify pay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So now they're only making their money off of their monthly subs uh, subscription subscriptions. Fees, right. Yeah. That's crazy. Right. That's a big change. So that's a massive dent in, in their revenue. How are they going to survive? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's definitely a question for them. Um, you know, and, and thinking about it even a little bit more, I think that Shopify is seeing other markets where subscriptions exist that they can now enter. So obviously they're an e-commerce platform, but you have tools like Patreon and, um, what is it called? Fan fair or something like that, where, where you're yeah. donating monthly to a membership community. And we are seeing those communities take off it within Shopify. And while I don't expect them to completely abandon e-commerce, I think that they see that membership and, and subscriptions of digital products can be put alongside uh, traditional e-commerce, let's say. And, mm -hmm. and by having a subscription API open, there will be tools launched on top of the platform that mm -hmm. enable um, additional revenue streams for mm -hmm. influencers, which by the way, is like a taking off industry. So as mm -hmm. influencers become brands, they can now launch subscriptions directly on Shopify. So that there's a big win for Shopify there. Interesting. While we're in the in the topic of um, of payments, what are your thoughts of um, about um, Shopify shop, or Shopify checkout? What it rolls off the you know off of what it rolls by default versus um, you know custom checkouts like Cart Hook? What would you? What are your thoughts? So unfortunately, when you start when you build a Shopify store, you're very limited in what you can do to modify your checkout pages. Mm -hmm. I think that is a big mistake by Shopify and they should ungate this to make them a little bit more accessible. The reason they don't do it is because those are very sensitive pages. They have to remain secure and there's certain limitations just legally in order to capture credit card information that they can allow. And they don't want to allow changes from somebody that's only paying them $30 a month uh, compared and then they open it up for people that pay them $2,000 a month. So they put a pay gate on it, but I would like to see that open up down market. So long story short, what I believe is that these other providers might have a higher conversion rate on their checkout process. They might be better optimized. I'll talk about one actually called Bolt, um, totally Bolt, bullish on this yeah. company. They unfortunately yeah. like kind of exited the Shopify ecosystem, so I don't talk to them too much anymore. But one yeah. of the slickest streamlined checkout processes sure. I've ever seen in my entire life, probably the best checkout you'll ever have. And, um, and, and I, I want them to be integrated fully into Shopify because what Shopify isn't doing, which frustrates me to no end, is split testing the checkout process and iterating it. They have billions of dollars of revenue they could improve on it because they're, they're doing this for so many stores. So if they can increase conversion rate by 0.1% by improving what the checkout looks like, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit. I think what they just did is just create Shopify pay and, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they, just left it that way. They, they, yeah, they kind of just, yeah, they roll out some, some products here and there mm -hmm. and they're focused a lot on their infrastructure and stuff. But man, that, that checkout opportunity for them, mm -hmm. I'm sure they know about it. It's just, yeah. you know, executing on it has its limitations in, in the yeah. way they were built. This is there's, there's another one called Fast Checkout. Um, they're, they're really bullish now on like social advertising. Um, they're, they're very similar to, to Bolt and um, they, have a, they, they have, you know, uh, millions from venture VC money. Um, we're talking yeah. hundreds of millions from VC money. Um, and yeah, it's, it's worth checking out, um, you know, head and head on, on Bolt, um, Fast and Bolt. Bolt actually came on the show um, a few months ago. Um, and nice. yeah, we've supported the show. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, so finally I, I'm in, in the Shopify store and I'd just like you to, it's almost like a lightning round where um, you could just give me your top three. Obviously, um, listeners do not take this, um, literally do not apply it, you know, this way, because, um, you know, obviously as Derek has said, um, you know, every body situation is different. This is Derek's opinion. Um, are you ready, Derek? 
I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Your top three apps for store design. Oh, well, I, I think Shogun is just kind of the one that, that I lean towards because it's easy drag and drop. I think they have a competitor called Gem Pages. Um, so those two would be my go-to. Also, a friend of mine, Ann Thomas, formerly at Pixel Union, just launched a tool called Design Packs, which is kind of a, a nice add-on functionality to themes. Okay. Fantastic. Notifications and pop-ups. Uh, yeah. Well, Privy is, is one of the leaders. Push Owl is actually really good on the push notification yeah. side of things, if you're looking for a standalone tool for that. Um, otherwise, you might be looking for a, a live chat solution. Um, we mentioned Sumo earlier. And then actually going with your email service provider's native pop-up tool is not a bad idea, okay. whether it's Klaviyo, OmniSend, or somebody else. Okay. SEO tools. Um, you know, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the more advanced ones. Um, so uh, headless commerce. There's Nacelle and Shogun Frontend for going into headless commerce, which can drastically improve uh, page speed load time. There is a tool that I kid if you're doing like 50,000 visitors a month and let's just say about 50,000 a month in revenue, it's called edge edge mesh edge mesh. Fundamentally it's called, it's called browser side caching. What happens is if you get more than one page view on average, the second page is going to load instantly because after it loads the first page, it loads the second, most likely second page in the background for the, on that browser, on that user's browser. It's brilliant. It does cost, I, I don't hold me to it, but something like $500 a month to really get into it. They have a free product, but like for their core functionality, you, you get that. And it's like, Man, that, that, that just like you can you actually they roll it out as a test so that you can split test it and they show you how much uh, revenue it makes you by, by loading faster, which is pretty mm. cool. Mm -hmm. um, checkouts. Uh, order bump we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one that works close to the checkout process called Rebuy, has, and they have a machine learning engine. Order bump mm -hmm. is like a really self-serve tool. I don't think they've built any um, AI functionality. So basically, you select the product and you just put it in the checkout, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, obviously, in the past, if we were doing subscriptions, it'd be on Recharge, and now it's going to be Recharge through Shop Pay, and with both subscriptions being a competitor. And if you aren't on Shopify, bolt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's, I'm just going to go for some around orders and shipping. Um, so there's a cool tool called Malomo. Go Malomo.com, I think. And they have a really nice uh, order status tracking page that includes upsells and cross sells on it. So it's mm -hmm. like a really smart system increases revenue through that tracking process. And then there's a tool called, uh, alternatively, maybe you could use them both at the same time, but probably not. There's a tool called Route, which is one of my go-tos. Um, it just works really well for merchants. Technically, it's a shipping insurance tool, but it comes with the order tracking uh, component to it, and it can reduce customer service inquiries. It reduces your costs of chargebacks and uh, returns and lost and damaged stolen items. So, uh, mm -hmm. And it's free for merchants, which is mm -hmm. kind of nice. Not bad, not bad. Invoices and receipts, particularly for like international retailers. I don't have a really good one for this. Um, I've, I've seen a few. I mean, oh, man. Um, where are we talking supply chain? Uh, if it's, um, no, if it's, um, just customer invoices and receipts. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, actually, well, for like order receipts and shipping notifications, yes. we've got spent. So yeah, it, it spent, Spendly. Spendly is actually pretty cool at that because they can actually they can bring in uh, LimeSpot and personalization engines within their own functionality, and then okay. they use the product you order to upsell, cross sell from those notification emails, and they have great tracking on it. I think the one thing that nobody realizes these are the most opened emails of all. They have like over a hundred percent open rate because people are constantly looking at that. So like, yeah, we want that to be prime real estate for, mm -hmm. for getting that customer into our loyalty program or something else. So it's really important mm -hmm. to, uh, to have that. Speaking I was thinking of which, lo like, loyalty programs, what, what's your best? Uh, what's your favorite? Loyalty, okay, so my, my top um, four or five recommendations on loyalty, it's going to be one of these, I think, from um, like 90% of the market. Loyalty Lion, uh, Smile, Grow Wave, Stamped, and oh man, there's, there's one more. Um, I'm cheating, going to my directory, uh, internal directory. Um, well, rise.ai, if you're specific to gift cards, I would say. Okay. Okay. And then customer reviews. 
Um, yeah, so we've got, uh, so stamped and grow wave are also loyalty and reviews, which I really like for those types of tools. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that's a great place to, uh, start a Kendo is a really strong one. Okay, Reviews.io is a, is another yeah. great one. Um, and then we've got looks and judge me on the low end of the market there. Mm -hmm. So, um, th those are two to consider and, oh man, uh, Yachtpo is a larger player in this space. Yeah. I've heard mixed things about them, but we Expensive. are required to mention them. And Wiremo is another one that's in the oh, space. Okay, I haven't heard of those ones. Okay, finally, I said finally, <laughs> but um, inventory management, um, you know, just warehouse, warehouse and tech. Yeah, so the um, Trade Gecko re recently got acquired by QuickBooks. It's now called QuickBooks Commerce, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. So if you're on QuickBooks and you want a great inventory management system, you go with them. Another thing worth mentioning is that there are a few third-party logistics providers like ShipBob who are now creating their own inventory management systems, which is oh, kind yeah. of nice because one of the goals of inventory management is working closely with your warehouse. Warehouse, right? so, exactly. Uh, it's, yeah, it, and it's free, which can save you thousands of dollars a month. But I've also heard that it's not as robust as full-fledged solutions like Fulfill.io, Scubana, Scuvault, um, and Stitch Labs, right? I think is the name mm -hmm. of the one. I always get that confused with like Stitch Fix. But yeah, Stitch Labs. Stitch Fix is e-commerce. Stitch Labs is e-commerce tech. <laughs> Derek, this has been amazing. Before I let you go, do you believe in um, in trust, you know, trust sales and, um, you know, the security sales? Do, do they work from your perspective? You, you mean like the trust badges that are yeah, like... trust, trust badges, sorry. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the results show that they do work. It's another form of social proof. I, mm -hmm. um, I actually have a demo with one of those solutions in the next week or so. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that they're important to think about. Um, it, it's a really tricky situation. Will it work for everyone? How important is it for me to have it? I think you can be fine in a business without it, but it, you know, we're looking to test another conversion rate optimization that might get us another 0.1% increase in, in sales. The one thing I'd say about it is don't use net. You can't do anything that's tricking the merchant, such as like a false countdown timer and things like that. Mm -hmm. Those things will look like they're increasing conversion rate, but lead to a bad user experience, which is going to lead to bad business. So make sure that you're using them in a altruistic way. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, back ops and recovery. For uh, store. Rewind is the only one I really know of. They're, they're yeah, the go yeah. Shout out. I did that intentionally because they're sponsor of this podcast. <laughs> Okay. Shout out right, Derek. <laughs> you said it. I didn't. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Um, this is overshot, but um, with, with, uh, I'm, I'm we just welcome. Um, I'm so happy about it. Um, for people who, who, who are listening up to now, they, they certainly will want to follow you. So where, where, what channels or what platforms do you hang out the most? Um, and um, where, where, where can people, you know, um, connect with you? Uh, find me on LinkedIn. My name is spelt kind of funny, so you have to go to the show notes to figure it out. Yeah. But uh, always happy to connect there. Otherwise, head on over to ecommercetech.io, book a consultation. They're completely free. We'll do a talk similar to this about all the tools that you're using, all the mistakes that you've made in the business, <laughs> and, and we'll build a little roadmap on what tools you should be looking into. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Cheers.